Wouldn't we love it if our students didn't give up so easily when they were faced with a tough problem? We want them to have the confidence and tools to make their way through these tough problems on their own. Um, but there are a lot of reasons why kids give up in math. And I want to focus actually on one place where I know kids do not give up. And that is video games, right? We can learn a lot actually about math education from how video game designers get us so interested in playing games and make it addictive. So let's start with the definition of game and see if it can apply to mathematics in some way. So I like to use this definition of a game that I learned from the book Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal. And it says, a game is a voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. So what does that mean? Like think about golf. Golf is a perfect example of this definition, right? If you really wanted to put a ball into a hole, you just walk up and drop it in there. But when we play golf, we voluntarily accept to take on this challenge of hitting it from 500 yards away with a club over obstacles and all of this other stuff. And somehow that's fun, right? Well, math problems can be exactly the same thing. If we think of them more like puzzles, then they can be voluntary. They're certainly unnecessary and they're an obstacle. So we can think of math problems as games, really. So I want to highlight four things that really good video game designers do to make games as addictive and interesting as possible. The first one is they start off exceedingly easy. So if you think about really popular games like Tetris or uh, Angry Birds and think about that first level, think about playing that first level. For example, in Tetris, you have these blocks that fall down, right? And if you think about level one of Tetris, the blocks fall down like this. It's extremely slow. You can almost not fail at the first level of Tetris. And it's designed like that on purpose, right? Second thing is, then over time, the game gets incrementally more challenging, really, really slowly. So the next level, the blocks come down a little bit faster and then a little faster until finally you're sort of right on the edge of what you're capable of and they're coming down just as fast as you can sort of manipulate them into place. And that's what perfect video games designers do is they make it so you feel like you're right on the edge. And we need to do the same thing in math where our students feel like I could probably get this if I just work at it, right? And then the last thing video games do is they don't tell us the answers, right? How boring would Angry Birds be if right on the first screen it says, well, pull back exactly this far, aim exactly in that direction, and you're sure enough, you're gonna win this level. No one would play the game, right? But in math, we always tell you the answer that's in the back of the book if you wanna look at it, right? We need to do some math where the answers aren't given so that it builds up some intrigue and curiosity and some excitement when we actually achieve that result. So let's apply this to actual math problems and see if it works. Let me draw a picture for you. Here's an array of dots. And I'm going to try and space them out evenly. Four rows and four columns. Now let me ask you a question. How many squares can you draw using the dots as corners? So that could be maybe a daunting question because there are a lot of squares up here. So let's start with something really, really easy. How about, let's just find one square. Right? This is like level one of Tetris. Well, here's a square where I use the corners on the dots, right? There's one. Okay, well now we can start counting because I can start to see now that there are several of these sort of one unit sized squares, right? There's one here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I can see that there are nine of those. Now let's crank it up to like level two or level three. Do you see any other squares? Let's get rid of this one. Are there any other squares up here? A lot of times people will notice that the whole thing itself is a square. Right? So that's one more square that we can add. Do you see any more? Well, there's another one. There's one like this. It's sort of three dots wide and three dots tall, so to speak. Are there any more that look like that? So we're starting to ramp up the complexity of this problem and make the counting a little bit more challenging but we're doing it in a very systematic fashion where we've already engaged in the problem and now it's getting just a little bit more complicated. 
So we can count those. Uh, I won't do it all here, but you might discover that there are about four of those. And then the question would be, is that all of them? Have we found all the squares? How do we know? I don't know. Uh, I will say this. You might eventually see that you could even draw a line like this. You don't have to go straight left and right or up and down. But maybe that will lead you to some other squares. That's like a more challenging level of Tetris, right? And then you have to count all of those. So this is an example where we can take a problem, we can start off really simple, we can increase the challenge as we go along, and it's not one where we would know the answer in advance, so I'm not telling you what the answer is. It's open-ended and it allows for exploration. So if we can do this with mathematics more often and make it more challenging, then we can get students to persevere because now they, they, they have a foothold into this problem they're going to want to try and get to that next level and keep going, right? Which when, when they quit is when the first question seems so difficult that why should I even bother? Imagine starting on level 10 of Tetris, the first time you've ever played. Now the blocks are coming down so fast, you can't even move the objects before they've already hit the bottom, right? What are you going to do? You're going to quit. You're never going to come back, right? So this is what we can do with mathematics. There's another side point here, which is, if you think about how every game of Tetris ends, it ends with all the blocks at the top, which means you failed. And yet, what do people do when they fail at Tetris? They start over and they play again. So this is the other thing that we need to be doing in mathematics, is we need to make failure or mistakes seem like they're just part of the game. Oh, you didn't get the right answer? Try again, so what? Just go after it again and again, right? We don't want people to feel bad when they don't get the right answer. We want them to feel like, oh, I just can do this if I try this again. So if we embrace these four things, make it really easy to get started into a problem, make the problem get challenging little by little by little by little so that it feels like I can keep making progress, we make mistakes just an accepted part of the game, and we don't give away the answers, then we're going to have kids feeling much more engaged, much more interested, and much more willing to try and persevere in problem solving.